There's a lot of macro data which has been pouring in. The government has announced a mini stimulus uh, for the government uh, employees. In fact, in, or, in order to stoke some kind of a consumption in the economy, right around the corner is the festive season, so timing is very interesting. And otherwise, to inflation, IIP, all of those data points have been coming in. So we thought of getting you a big voice who understands the readings very well and will help us decode what it means for the street. Uh, Jahangir Aziz uh, uh, is joining us uh, from J.P. Morgan, uh, based in New York, of, of course, right now. Uh, Jahangir, uh, thank you very much for your time. First of all, I would like to understand from you, how did you read uh, the steps which the government has actually announced this time around, uh, focused on stoking consumption? Do you think the intention of the government will lead to some amount of renewed demand? Right. So, you know, if you look at the, you know, broad headlines, there are two parts to it. The one part of it is this very convoluted scheme by which, you know, if you're a government servant and for the last four years or something like that, that you haven't used your leave travel allowance, then you can use it this time to buy things in kind uh, online. And if you have, you know, goods on GST over 12 percent, I mean, uh, it's, 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 it's very difficult to understand what the impact of something like that will be. Then you look at the other part of it, which is, you know, increased uh, uh, infrastructure spending in the Northeast. Now, look, all of this is a good thing, but I really can't imagine how you uh, have additional infrastructure spending in any part of the world with an infection and a pandemic going on and with, you know, people in masks and being separated by six, uh, six feet. I mean, I, I'm not even exactly sure how you even lay a railway line doing that efficiently. Uh, but more importantly, and this, this is the part that is, you know, uh, really inexplicable, that if, you, if the government does has you know, if you do actually provide extra stimulus, and then you say at the same breath that the government, government borrowing or the fiscal deficit is going to remain the same, then really there has to be some other place from where spending has been reduced uh, because overall there isn't really any change in the amount of fiscal stimulus. Now, by rearranging expenditure, you might get, you know, a little bit of demand going, but, you know, it's going to be in the second decimal. So I'm really confounded by the logic of the government by saying that, well, you're putting out more extra spending and we are doing extra stimulus, but at the same time, same breath saying, well, there's no real change in the overall boring. So, as I said, you know, it, 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 it really confounds me. Right. Uh, Jagir, uh, you know, uh, inflation numbers are showing that it's rearing its head once again. And lately, uh, the fear on the street is that the way inflation has been rising back, uh, it may limit RBI's hand to cut rates further. Uh, do you think this inflation coming back is transitionary uh, in nature? Sure. Uh, so, look, you know, if you look at uh, infl headline inflation and you break it up into food inflation and core inflation, then the way we are looking at it, you know, on a month on month basis, core inflation has gone down from momentum of our uh, you know, annualized rate of 6% to about 3% in the last one month. What has really pushed head inflation up is that there is a massive increase in food inflation. From that, it is very difficult to say that that's an indicator of demand coming back. It's more of an indicator of the supply disruptions that are taking place in the agricultural sector. And because of the supply disruptions, you have supply disruption, sorry, uh, you are continuing to see food inflation go up. And, you know, I agree with, you know, the RBI that this is transitory. But, you know, the fact that core core inflation has gone down, uh, that suggests that, you know, alongside, you know, uh, a very a, a surprising decline in industrial production suggests that, you know, it's, you know, that things in even in the manufacturing sector in India, things don't look that good. Jagir, uh, how are you really assessing the quality of recovery which is underway both globally as well as in India? Uh, the, the data points, be it the PMI indicators, auto sales, other high frequency indicators, even commentary from managements seem to be suggesting uptick. Uh, what's your own reading and how durable could this be? Look, I think the trajectory of recovery in India is exactly the way in the rest of the world. We are seeing recovery taking place across the world in manufacturing. We have seen some recovery taking place in the services sector across the world. 
but that seems to have stalled. It seems to have stalled, and in some places, it's actually declining, such as in Europe, uh, largely because you know the infection rates are going up. Mobility uh, indicators are sort of stalling. And even though mobility indicators in some parts might be picking up, it is very difficult to see how services, uh, you know, recovery actually continues at that pace. So we are in a world of, you know, two-speed recovery. Manufacturing is going to pick up. Services won't go. Some services are likely to uh, pick up as fast. We are going to see an incomplete recovery take place, and that is the way in which is working out in India. In the case of India, you know, you know. More than half of the economy is driven by services, so the impact of the fact of of the slowdown in services, or or the, or the less uh, uh, fast or, or, or the slower recovery in services, is going to have a you know bigger in, uh, impact on GDP growth. Looking at manufacturing, which is you know much smaller portion of GDP uh, in India than elsewhere, uh, is not an indicator of the health of the economy. Uh, especially if you know we do know that the pandemic has had a disproportionately larger impact on services. So uh, you know uh, the the recovery in India is going to be incomplete, as it's going to be in the rest of the world, and the incompleteness is going to be driven by a services sector that is going to slow grow much slower than manufacturing. Uh, so I think it's not very different from the rest of the world. Right, Jagir. So if one were to put a, uh, put a you know, kind of a time horizon. Uh, and if we were to talk about when exactly could the recovery come in to add pre-COVID levels, uh, when would that be in your view? So again, you know, uh, we probably going to see manufacturing recover to pre-COVID levels probably in the next two, three quarters. But on services, it's going to take a much longer time. I think for services to recover, even to pre-COVID levels, you know, you really require uh, a, either the public health system in India actually being able to bring down the infection rate, which it hasn't been able to do for the last six, seven months, or you wait for a vaccine. And you don't not only wait for a vaccine to be, uh, an effective vaccine to be uh, discovered, but you wait for the vaccine to be administered to 70, 75% of the population so that there is herd immunity. And that most likely we are looking at in the second half of 2021. Uh, so, uh, you know, and again, by the way, this is not something that is, you know, only for India's case. This is something that is probably going to be for most countries in the world. And again, you know, uh, you you know, you can see recovery and growth taking place because things were so bad in the second quarter. Uh, but in level terms, it's going to take a very long time uh, for uh, for for activity to recover, even to pre-COVID levels, particularly in India, which has a very large component of services uh, that, as I've been saying, has been disproportionately affected. Uh, clearly, government policies play a role in this, uh, but that's a separate issue altogether. Jagir, uh, how's the buzz there in the U.S. ahead of the election, the presidential elections? Everybody is watching out for it, even emerging markets. How important would they be this time for emerging markets, in your view? It's, it's, it's very important for, 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 for emerging markets. I mean, uh, you know, the world could, world could move dramatically from... You know, a world in which, you know, there was a very large increase in anti-globalization forces, anti-globalization sentiment, you know, including the U.S.-China trade conflict, the trade tariffs uh, alongside it. And then you could see an administration which moves away from that policy. Uh, our sense is that, look, you know, all most of the polls suggest that, you know, it is likely that there's going to be a, 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 a Democratic White House question is whether or not there's going to be a democratic senate uh, but broadly it seems as if we are moving to a world in which the pressures on anti-globalization forces will probably recede and that is a big positive now for emerging markets because we all depend on global trade and uh, and and of course you know there will be you know people who will, uh, countries that will uh, benefit more from it and countries that will benefit less from it clearly countries that will benefit more from it who are tied to the manufacturing manufacturing cycle and that seems to be china and north asia more than anyone else um, but i think also alongside the u.s election there is this question of the vaccine right do we get a vaccine by the end of the year or, or early next year and if the vaccine is found an effective vaccine is found then i think that's also a game changer 
uh, for emerging markets, but the game changing will now be felt in countries such as India, South Africa, and Brazil, which really have struggled uh, with this public health system to bring down uh, the infection rate. At least now there is a way out in which these countries can, uh, over a period of time, maybe six months, nine months, over a period of time, actually bring an end to this uh, pandemic. Right. Uh, Jagir, one last question. How have you been analyzing the commentary coming out of RBI? There's a fear on the street here that uh, the rate cycle may be pausing. In fact, the rate cycle may pause for the entire emerging market. Do you subscribe to that view or do you see scope for further rate cuts here in India? So I think, you know, we are way too obsessed with, you know, interest rate cuts or fiscal stimulus uh, supporting demand. I think that you know train has sort of left the station at this point in time. If we really wanted to boost demand, that was probably about three, four months back. Now it's the time to have monetary policy and fiscal policy that will preserve balance sheets of households and balance sheets of SMEs uh, and also of corporates. So that when the recovery starts, when we do get a vaccine and when that vaccine has been administered, so somewhere in the second half of 2021, when there is a reasonable chance of the economy truly normalizing, that our households and our SMEs and our corporates are not hamstrung by very damaged balance sheets. And that requires you know, a enormous amount of income support to be provided right now. Again, not to boost uh, uh, you know, demand. You really cannot boost demand when you know uh, you are under, under under these very trying conditions of the pandemic. It doesn't really work that way. But you can preserve balance sheets, and I think fiscal policy needs to play its part, which it hasn't, by providing you know significant amount of income support. And here I'm talking about income support. I'm not talking about spending in infrastructure or things like that. That can only have an effect only when the pandemic is behind us and it can't actually have much of an impact while the pandemic is ongoing. And I think on the interest rate front, interest rate needs to be brought down. I think I find it very inexplicable when the um, MPC says, well, you know, the increase in inflation, inflation or the inflationary forces are all transient and we are operating under an inflation targeting regime, which basically uh, sees inflation 12, 18 months ahead. And if these are transient forces, why are we why are we struck you know, stuck you know by these transient forces and backward looking inflation and and you know if truly they are transient then we should be cutting rates now and i think real rates looking forward looking into the future 12 months ahead uh you know if inflation truly is going to come down then real rates right now are way too high so I, I would prefer to have a, a monetary policy right now that is cutting rates much more right now, simply to reduce debt service on one hand, and a government that is providing significant amount of income support so that people are not deceiving, they are keeping their, their, their balance sheets intact, such that when the recovery starts, they will not be hamstrung by damaged balance sheets. But that's clearly not the way in which either monetary policy or fiscal policy in India is going at this point. All right, uh, Jagi, we'll let you go on that one. Thanks so much for joining us. We really value your inputs. That was uh, Jagi Aziz uh, talking about the macros.